So as we enter part two of the scientific process or scientific method, we're still continuing to look at testing our hypothesis. And after you've um, created your procedure, you have your materials list and your step-by-step uh, -step instructions listed out, now you get to make observations as you run your experiment. So an observation is noting or recording, physical recording, of an event, a characteristic, a behavior, anything that can be detected as you're running your experiment. So you might take measurements, you might count things, you might use your senses, so smell something, feel something, look at something, uh, hear something. Those would all be examples of making observations. So there's an observation and there's an inference. We have to be really careful as we're collecting data to truly be collecting evidence. So an observation is recording an event, a characteristic, and something that be conducted can be detected. It's something that you can show. An inference is a logical explanation of an observation that's drawn from prior knowledge or experiences, meaning it's the essentially the guess that you're making that's logical based on the evidence that you've gathered that's your conclusion which we'll get to in a little bit however you have to be very careful not to make inferences while you're collecting data and record them as fact so as you're making observations be sure to truly be collecting evidence um, Inferences are used as an attempt to explain what we've seen is the easiest way to think about the difference between the two. So let's use this polar bear as an example. Some observations that I can make about this polar bear are that there's only one of them. I can count them. The water temperature is 35 degrees Fahrenheit. I could take the temperature of the water if I was there that the polar bear is sitting on a piece of ice. So that's a visual observation that I've made. Although it doesn't include numbers, it is still considered an observation. And the polar bear's nose is black. Again, it's a visual description that I'm able to give by looking at the picture. Inferences that I can make based on looking at this picture are polar bears live in a cold climate. It's an observation that I'm making based on knowing that the temperature of the water is 35 degrees, that he's sitting on ice. So it's a guess based on the information that I am given based on the evidence. I can also make an inference that the polar bear is scared. It's one polar bear sitting out alone on floating ice. So I might assume that that polar bear is scared. I can't prove it, but it's an assumption based on the evidence, which means that it's an inference. So I want you to practice this. I'd like you to go ahead and look at this picture and on your notes guide, write down two, go ahead and pause this after I give you the directions, write down two observations you can make, things that can be shown or proven in the picture and one inference that you can make about the picture. So go ahead and pause. All right, so there is additional practice that's listed on your paper. Go ahead and come back to that after you watch your flip. So next we're going to analyze our results. So here's where we get to do a little bit of math in science. So analyzing is going to be taking the data that we've gathered. So you have to have a data table. That data table might have numbers or your um, description observations on it, but there's some key parts to include on a data table. Um, you need to make sure that you have your title, that you have your information listed out in rows, that you have different columns, that you include all the data within those rows and columns so that it's neat and orderly, and that when you have your units listed, that they're listed, so a unit would be, for example, degrees Celsius, you want those units to be listed up in the header, in the title, not within the boxes, because otherwise your data table gets very cluttered. 
You often want to make your data table prior to beginning your experiments so that you have a place to record the data as you're gathering it and making your observations. Once you've made your observations, you want to have the parts to a good graph. So you'll make a graph, and when you make that graph, they need, it needs to include, again, your title, which is probably going to be the same or similar title as your data table. You want to include an x-axis label and a y-axis label. So x-axis goes across the bottom. The y-axis goes up the side. Um, describing, I like to keep those one to three words if possible so that they're short and simple. Those will often be the same headings that you have in your data table. And then you also need to have a scale up the side with numbers of whatever your uh, variable might be. And then you also have to have your groups listed out across the bottom, depending on the type of graph that you have. You should also include a key that describes what it is that the picture or the plot is showing you on your graph. So a big thing about graphs is knowing which type of graph to make. I often see people um, make a line graph when they should have made a bar graph or vice versa, make a bar graph when they should have made a, a line graph. So if you can think about the data that you're collecting, this is how you can identify which type to make. So if you have a bar graph, you're going to use that when you're showing frequency that something occurs. So oftentimes if you have a group or individual, different groups or different individuals, those will probably be, and you're comparing them, you're probably going to put those into a bar graph or possibly a histogram. Um, on a bar graph or a histogram, the x-axis is labeled with what's being measured and the y-axis is labeled as how with how frequently that occurs or the number of, in this case, people for this example. Um, a histogram is going to be very, very similar. However, each of these bars will not be an individual group. They might be a um, range. Say if we were taking height, we would have a range of five foot to five foot three, and then the next bar might be five foot 3.1 to five foot four and so on. Um, circle graph is going to identify, um, you're going to use a circle graph when you, sorry, are showing the percent of a whole. So if I have, usually if I'm using percents and I'm looking at it compared to 100% or the whole group, I'm probably going to use a circle graph. And then finally, line graphs. You'll use a line graph when you're showing a change over time. So if something is being uh, measured over the course of time and what you're measuring is what you're looking at the change, then you're probably using a line graph. Lastly, we have to analyze what the numbers mean, sometimes using some other math tools aside from graphs and data tables. So sometimes we have to actually do the math, the adding, the dividing, the multiplying. So mean would be one thing that we would find useful when analyzing our data. We might need to find the average of a set of, set of data. A set of data would be the information that's within your data table. So to find the mean, you add up all of the data points, so 42 plus 46 plus 54, and divide that number by the set, or divide that number by the number of data points in the set. So in this case, I had five numbers, so I divided by five to get my average, or my mean, air temperature. Another number that I might find useful as I'm analyzing my data is the median number or the middle of a set of data. So to find the median or the middle, I'm going to take again all of my numbers, except this time I'm going to find the middle number. If the middle number, if there's two middle numbers, say 54 and 61, if I had one more number there, if those two were my middle numbers, 
then I would take the average, I would add those two together and divide by two in order to figure out what my median number would be. So in this case, as I line up my five, my middle or median number is 54 degrees Celsius. And lastly, we have the range. So the range is the difference between the highest value and the lowest value in a set of data. And so to find the range, you subtract the lowest value from the highest value to determine the difference. So if I set up my numbers, I take 65 minus 42 degrees Celsius, and I find that the range in air temperature for this data set is 23 degrees Celsius range. Finally, once we've analyzed all the data, we've made the observations, we've looked at what it means, now we draw some conclusions from that data. As we're drawing a conclusion, it's basically a summary. We're going to restate and shorten up all the information that we've gathered up to this point from where we started with our question all the way to our new knowledge and the inferences that we've made based on the data we collected. So it is not just a statement of the inferences, however, a summary of everything we've done. The reason we do that is oftentimes scientists will read this first. So I'm going to go through each of the different things that uh, scientists would be looking for in order to know if they really want to look into and read the details of your investigation. So the first thing you need to include in your conclusion in your paragraph is the first R to restate your question. This is probably going to sound something like in this experiment I and then state what you were testing for. Your E is going to be an explanation. You want to explain what you did in your experiment in a summary. You are not going to list out every single thing. In order to test this, I, and then a shorter one to two sentence explanation of what you did, not all the details. Now you get to restate again. So once you've said what you did, you state your hypothesis and then you talk about whether it was supported or not supported based on your data. So you actually get a, a chance to talk about what the data was based on or, and what that means for the hypothesis that you made. Before I began this experiment I hypothesized that and then continue on and state whether it was supported or not supported. It can't be proven because we don't know if you were to repeat the experiment over and over and over, if you would get the same results. However, in this experiment, your data may have supported what you thought would happen. There's always going to be some uncertainties or errors that possibly were made during your experiment. So things that maybe went wrong. Maybe there was something that contaminated your experiment, or something got knocked over partway through, or something was blocking the light. Those would be examples of uncertainties that could have affected the results of your experiment. And lastly, you want to include the new knowledge. What new information did I learn because of doing this experiment? And if you can't think of new things that you really learned and gained from it, maybe it was a not at all what you expected. Maybe you have some new questions or maybe it sparked some new experiments that you want to do or if you could do it again next time you might do what? So once you've summarized it you need to communicate it. This might be the most important part of the scientific method but somehow you need to get those results published. Maybe you're sharing it with your teacher or your friends or maybe it's a bigger venue where you're actually publishing it online or um, to a magazine or a publisher at some point with a researching company. So no matter what part of science you're in you can do all of these steps throughout every field of science on almost every experiment you can come up with.